All right, I'm Randy Miller, and I'm a higher impact business coach. Uh, I also do life coaching. Uh, in fact, today, uh, Nancy and I were earlier at a BNI meeting, and so we uh, kind of uh, talk about those kinds of things, and I appreciate your invitation here uh, today. So uh, I want to start with a, with a story, and this goes back eons ago in my life, but it's stuck with me uh, for a very long time. I, I'm a drummer or at least I was a drummer at one time, and I travel with a, uh, a group across the country, uh, Europe, Mexico, Canada, so we, we did a lot of traveling. And early on in the group's experience, we had a, uh, what is now at the, the old model, but now then it was the new model, the GMC motor coach, and it was this light pastel yellow. I mean, it was cutting edge in the day. It looked like a uh, you've seen an Airstream trailer, you know, the polished aluminum trailers. So it looks sort of like that, except it was yellow, uh, and, uh, and it was a motorhome. So uh, there were eight of us traveling in this motorhome. So it was uh, a little crowded, but uh, we survived it. So one, one day we were on our way to Bauxite, Arkansas. Anyone familiar with Bauxite? Yeah, it's uh, Alcoa Aluminum is located in that area. So. I'm driving at this particular time, and we got lost. Uh, some of the directions that we were, had been given to our event location were a little off, so we got lost. And we were literally out in the boonies. I mean, it was just trees, 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 and more trees, and a two-lane road, <clears throat> uh, and, and every pothole that ever existed, I think, was on this road. So this new GMC motorhome was kind of bouncing all over the place. So we were looking for a way to get on the right road and, and get in the right direction. So there was an old, dilapidated, uh, let's call it an antique service station that had probably been closed for 30 years. In front of this service station, there were two old men sitting in rocking chairs. Now, I didn't see a home nearby or anything. It's just this old service station, and they were sitting in the shade of the overhang. They had on bib over overhauls, a white shirt, and both of them were wearing straw hats. So it was kind of right out of the movies kind of thing. You know, you could almost hear the banjo in the background. So um, I pulled over, opened my little sliding window, and one of the gentlemen stood up and I said, can you help me? We're lost. And I told him where we, uh, where we were supposed to be playing. And he's so helped me. He walked up to the side of the vehicle, took off his straw hat, scratched his head just a bit, and he looked at me and he said, you can't get there from here. <laughs> How many of you have heard that phrase before? <laughs> I mean, so help me, he said it. And he was as serious as he could be. You can't get there from here. So I said, Tom, I'm, I'm not 26 anymore, but my 26-year-old, all I could muster respect, I looked at this old gentleman and I said, well, sir, where do I need to go to get started? And he said, uh, well, go to that stop sign, turn left, and then at the first street, turn left again. And you're going to go, and he told me the rest of the directions. And then it would become familiar to us where we were headed. But that phrase and that experience is stuck in my mind since then. You can't get there from here. So where do I need to go to get started? So sometimes we all feel like that, you know? We feel like, in fact, I, I just talked to someone just today, and I was uh, in a coaching meeting yesterday in York, Pennsylvania, with someone who was, you know, they're very successful at what they do, but they're kind of in a place where it's like, where do I, where do I go to start? What do I do to get started? So today we're going to be talking uh, some, and I'm going to be involving you in some exercises. <clears throat> excuse me, about getting started from where you are. And probably every person in the room is at a different place. So, let me use a little bit of an illustration. I want you to think, where were you before you came here today? If you were at home or if you were at some other location, every one of you started from a different place to get here today. So, if I present to you as if you are all in the same place, uh, I will have missed the mark. So I'm not going to pretend that you're at the same place, and that you're starting at the same place. In fact, I'm not going to 
do a presentation, so to speak, though we'll do some of that. I'm going to engage you throughout uh, our time together for the next, uh, well now it's about 50 minutes, and then we're going to have lunch. So, one of the things that uh, I, I want to do is first, and I'm not, and I've, I've learned having trained all over the country, uh, I've learned not to pass out the information. Anyone have a teaching background? Yeah. So you don't give the students the information, and I know I'm stepping out of camera range here, so can you pass those back, please? Uh, and I, I didn't count how many people are in the room, but we've, uh, I think I've got about 15 copies of those, so if they'll just wind up at the back of the room, maybe there's an extra one or two. Did you want to get one? I'll get one. Okay. okay. So, I want you to, don't, don't take a look so much at reading the top, but look at the colored bars. <laughs> so, essentially, some of what we're going to do today is pause. We're going to start with pause. So, what's the next word under pause? Reflections. There you go. So, reflection. So, you go from a pause to reflection and then awareness. awareness. So, you have these kind of aha, you know, firing in your brain moments where you think of this, you think of that. Sometimes when I do that, I'm, I'm writing a to-do list, you know, stuff I <laughs> want to do or my wife wants me to do. So uh, stuff like that. So we're, gonna, we're going to engage in some of that today. So then those three, the first top three, what do they have to do with? Being. So what? State of being. Being, okay, just being. So we're going to have a moment where we can just be in just a few moments here. <clears throat> the second set of words are what? Intentionality. Intentionality. So we're going to focus on intentionality. By the end of the meeting today, one of the things that uh, I want you to kind of have processed through a little would be a roadmap. So uh, what are some goals and how do we get there? So we're going to be doing that. So we're, we're going to use this process. Now the... What's the last one in the list? Accountability. Accountability. So I don't know if uh, I've heard that some of you have a coach. Uh, in fact, just uh, just today, someone was talking about accountability. They they have what they called an accountability partner, but often a coach is someone who helps us be accountable. I have a coach. Uh, in fact, I talked with him just before coming into the meeting. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So accountability helps us with, and what does the what's the word to the right of the word of accountability? Momentum. Momentum. So the problem often is this, and you're going to see this in, in just a second. Uh, the problem is oft, often this, and I mentioned this in the in the email that Cindy sent out to you, is we start here, and we rise fast and then fall. And this is, <clears throat> this is a New Year's resolution. Would you agree? So, <clears throat> I feel like I swallowed a butterfly or something here. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> so, flip the page over. On the second page, on the back page, you'll see this. There's a line that goes up more consistently, consistently like this. And this is called the 1% factor. So, <clears throat> often people rise rapidly, they make great declarations, you know, this is my goal, this is what I'm going to do this year, etc., etc., but then something begins to happen, they lose momentum, and they fall off of their, of the, uh, of the goal track. So, <clears throat> one of the, one of the uh, books that I would suggest, if you haven't read this, uh, is The Slight Edge. Does that sound familiar to anyone? The Slight Edge. It's by Jeff Olson. So Jeff talks about this. <clears throat> In fact, Darren Hardy also talks about this. And the difference between this line and this line is simply behaviors. <coughs> it's simple behaviors. So often many of us approach what we're going to do. We approach it in a way that we want this big aha moment that just changes us internally and externally, and we, we kind of wait around for that, or we feel like we've experienced it, something happens. You know, sometimes, I don't know if you've had this happen, but I've been kind of reading something or, or considering something, and I'm, 
making a list or, or just, you know, just um, uh, trying to be aware of where I am in the moment. And all of a sudden something, you know, I get an aha moment. And you want to look around and see if anyone else saw it. You know, it seems so dramatic. But if that's what happens and we begin to fall off, then we lose traction and we really don't continue to head toward the goals that we have. So uh, I, I come into a room like this as a, as a trainer and coach. I come in thinking that I am not going to tell you anything that you don't know already. I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times and I've sat where you are seated hundreds and hundreds of times as well. So it's, uh, there's a there's an old phrase, wisdom, that there's nothing new under the sun. There may be new ways of saying it. There may be new methods of saying it. But there's really, it's about reminding us of the thing that we know. Now, many of you, the moment, the moment I, I did this, there was actually an emotional reaction to that. Because I saw some of you nod, some of you smile, some of you go, oh, yeah. You know, so this is, this is kind of where many of us live. And we want to move toward the intentionality of just making small changes. So about, uh, probably now, about four months or, or so ago, I was at a, a coaches meeting that we have uh, monthly. I, I was at a coaches meeting in, in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. And something that was said in the meeting uh, just kind of prompted me to think, you know, I want to get, I want to get more fit. I want to get my weight more under control, and I have, in the past, I have been at as much as 235 pounds, and I left 235 and brought it all the way down to 190, and then, any, anyone had that creeping experience? But I was there, I was there in the 190, 195 range for almost five years, and then I got happy and fatter. <laughs> and so I, I, began, I began to eat more of my wife's cooking or something. I don't know, enjoy more pie. I, I, I don't know what happened. And I, honestly, it's like incremental things. It's the ice cream at night. That was so good last night. I think I'll have some more tonight. You know, or it's the little cookies. Remember I mentioned my father-in-law? So at the end of every meal, he eats a little cookie. He eats a cookie. Uh, or a wafer cookie, well, I don't want him to do that alone, you know what I'm saying? So, so I, want to, I want to join him, you know? So he eats maybe one or two, and they're just so good, one or two just won't do. So what happened is then the weight began to creep up again. So here I am at Lancaster. So here's what I know. I, I know this. I know this starting here. The question is, what one thing would I change? Because I know this, that if I change one thing, typically other things will also accompany that change. So it's like knocking over one domino, and it knocks over a lot of other dominoes. So I, I was driving home, it's about a two-hour drive. <coughs> I was driving home, and I thought, all right, I'm going to stop at Giant, and I'm going to buy oatmeal. Now, I was eating sweet cereals, you know. I mean, I have a sweet tooth, so you know, I was eating sweet cereals. And I would eat sweet cereals and sweeten my sweetened cereals. <gasps> yeah. So that's where the poundage came from, you know, or at least one of the sources. So if you prompt yourself in the morning, then that sugar is going to just scream for more sugar through the day, right? So that's what was happening to me. So on the way home, I could, it was one of those moments where I could almost, I could almost take you to the point on the highway where this decision was made. So I made the decision. I stopped at the giant. I got the oatmeal. I went home with the oatmeal. Now, that's the first part of it. The second part of it is every single day deciding to stay with the oatmeal. This is my father-in-law loves those frosted mini wheats in the morning. And my oatmeal was sitting right next to the frosted mini wheats. And I moved my oatmeal, just a, a small shift, remember 1%. I moved the oatmeal from next to the frosted mini wheats to the shelf below it. 
so I didn't have to look at the mini wheats. Now, what am I talking about? It's not about mini wheats. It's not about oatmeal. It's not about any of that. What's it about? Somebody, feedback. 1% change. 1% change. A small change. A decision followed by a small change. An incremental change. So that incremental change started causing me to think in terms of what was I drinking, how much, what were the portions that I was eating. So I, I began to lose and I remember walking in the closet, <clears throat> and I, I came out with a jacket that I hadn't worn in probably a year and a half. I walked out, I put these pants on, and I said, I said, sweetie, look at this. I can't believe I can wear these pants. You know, it was great. It's great. So walking in and saying, I can, I can wear anything that's in my closet versus only being able to wear one or two, or I had to buy more. So again, what happened happened at a, a table similar to what we were here, except it was a, a, a big oval round table kind of table. We were all sitting around facing one another. So it happened in a meeting just like this. And that started the process of making a 1% incremental change. So if you would take, do we have any extras in the back? We have one left over. Would you mind bringing another thing? Thank you. I have to stay in camera range because if not, she'll, yeah, well, she'll shame me. And, you know, and it was, you sat in the back. This is what you earned by sitting in the back. So here we go. <laughs> What's your name? Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate that. So on the back, if you'll look at this in a little more detail. So notice, notice the, the growth area is above the center line. So here's, here's something that uh, Olson talks about. You and I... Every, every time we make a decision, we're either making a decision up toward our success or we're playing down away from our success. That, that, those two lines right there, <laughs> oh, I hate them. And yet I love them. Because today, there, are, there were decisions that you made. One was to be here. So that's a decision to go up from this simple baseline that goes across. And this would be life. Now you can, you can say, okay, this is, because I, I do life coaching, so this is, if it's life in general, there are specific things that we're going to look at in a moment. There are specific things that we could narrow down but then we have to look at that and say, well, what decisions am I making if it's in relationships? It could be my significant, my wife, it could be my kids, it could be all kinds of things. It, it, if, it's, if it's in relationships, if it's in career or business, what are the decisions that you make? Or what are the decisions you don't make? So my father-in-law that I mentioned earlier, Ralph, he was in real estate with Shannon and Lux, but then became Weicker for 22 years. And I asked him the other day, I told him, I said, I'm gonna be speaking here, what was one of the most challenging things that you faced as an agent or that you saw other agents face in that 22 year period? His answer was follow up. <laughs> Would you agree? You know, because what happens is, uh, and this is from you know, sales training and sales engagement and being not only in sales, but in sales management, I've seen this over and over and over again where, you know, we, we get engaged in the process and or we're overcoming our fears about engaging in the process and then we do that and then we're excited about doing that and we forget to follow up on the very thing that could lead us to the actual sale. So a personal experience from some years ago, uh, my wife and I were looking for a townhome uh, in the area just before you cross the Monocacy River headed toward uh, uh, to Walkersville. And <clears throat> we, we looked and looked and looked. We looked at all sorts. You've, you've had folks like that, you know, we just couldn't be satisfied, you know. And then finally we found an area that we liked. And we said, well, we, we like this area. Um, and I believe the address was Captain's Court. And so we looked around and behind that, if you're familiar with that area, 
behind that is this huge, I think it's about an 80 or so acre meadow that leads to the river. So we looked at this and we thought, we love this, we, we love this area, but none of those homes were for sale. So the agent that we were talking with about it, um, you know, we, we left our contact at that point uh, that day, and, and the next thing we know, we get a phone call from her, and she says, uh, well, last evening, I walked around to every home in that community, and uh, just the night before, there was a couple that just sat at dinner table, and they talked about selling their property and moving. So, it was the primo property. So as an agent, if you've wondered whether that works or not, it works. Because I'm evidence of it working. So imagine if, if you or if she had decided to not take that step. So you know if you've done something like that, where you've cold called, knocked on doors, that isn't necessarily, necessarily easy because you, your fear is, your anxiety is, you're going to get no and no and no and no, and you just maybe get up from my you know, meal to you know, answer the door. So it's that 1% difference. It's making that phone call that earned her her commission. So whether it's Ralph or me or you, if it's the one, what is the one thing what is the one thing, the one small thing that can make the big difference for you? So we're going to take another look. So by the way, these, these pages are yours. You get to keep those. I'm going to ask uh, from him a little bit of help. I don't know, have you ever, any of you ever done what's called a life wheel that looks like this? I'm holding this so the camera can see it. Mm -hmm. So the back of the sheet is the assessment, if you'll take those and pass them back, please. Same here. So the back is the assessment. So go to go to the line side first. And this only takes about three minutes uh, to do this, maybe even a little less. But we're going to begin with this exercise in engaging you. So now once you've once you've done the back, and all you're doing is just checking, this is a, a self-assessment. So think of it like this: this is only a, a snapshot. This is not the cinema. So where you are right now, uh, you could be very different uh, from today, two weeks from now, or a month from now, or a year from now. And today may be different than two weeks ago. So once you've completed the back, then flip it over and kind of color it in. So can you see how I've colored this in? So you just color it in so that you get this jagged looking wheel, okay? Uh, it's, it's not round at all. So it'll be a great visual for you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. It'll be a great visual for you to just kind of see where you feel you're very successful uh, or where you feel like you need uh, to grow. And uh, so take just a moment, and I'll give you a second to not listen and do the exercise. Thank you for the smile, by the way. <laughs>
And at the bottom, under the circle, on the, uh, on the wheel side, there are three lines. So please make sure that you uh, select and fill in those three lines. It says, what are your three greatest focus areas and action steps for this exercise? collect these or give them to anyone. assessment side. <coughs> Usually using, it doesn't make any noise though when you're using one of those. <laughs> nice to hear the scratching sounds. Maybe about another 30 seconds and then we'll, we'll move on. Some of you are continuing. As uh, you, you, may have, uh, you may have seen the Winter Olympics. How many of you saw the Winter Olympics this past year? Okay. So I, I believe it's called the biathlon, which is a, uh, a race where they ski and shoot, and ski and shoot, and ski and shoot. And they do all that in the cold, and they do it with heavy equipment on it that is protecting them from the cold, and their ski equipment and so forth. And I was watching it, kind of listening to the... Uh, commentators, one of which I believe was uh, a gold medalist from the past. So they were talking about what these skiers and shooters have to be able to do. So again, you know, if you've, if you've done any physical exercise or skiing or anything like that, you know that your, your body kind of gets into this uh, kind of, you know, tight muscles. And to try to do something that is as pinpoint uh, and precision, with precision is really tough. So at 55 yards, it's longer, it's over 55 yards, longer than half of a football field, they hit targets uh, that are about this size. But you, you could say, well, yeah, but they're using a scope. Of course, that helps. Well, not if your breathing is off or not if your muscles are shaking. Uh, this uh, past weekend, my wife and I went to the uh, National Cemetery, and we wanted to see the... Uh, uh, the changing of the guard at the unknown, uh, the tomb of the unknown soldier. And I was holding the camera, and I said, later when we watch this, you're going to see the shaking, because it was freezing cold outside, and the sun was going down, and it was getting colder. And I don't know how long it takes for them to do that, but I was shaking the whole time. And I realized this is going to be a shaky image when we finish. Now, think of if they're trying to hit a target it's four by four, but then the next target is five of these in a row, about the size of a golf ball, at 55 yards. So whatever, whatever you're about to respond in the question I'm going to ask you in a moment, however you're responding to it, it's about, it's about this target that's off here, and whatever you do here, this, this choice matters. So we're shooting at a target that's like this off in the distance. So I want you to take a look at your wheel. And the lowest ones on the wheel, take a look at when you answer the questions at the bottom, or rather on the line, you put the answer to the question. 
on those lines. You put three things. So looking at those three things, at the top of the circle, I want you to think in terms of what simple behavior, what could you do just outside of the margin around the circle? So when you look at, when you look at your circle, right out here somewhere in this margin, whatever was the lowest, the three lowest, that you want to, want to give some time for growth, what would be a couple of behaviors, no more than three, but just a couple of behaviors that might change the level that you mark. So if you were at a four, what could bring it up to a five? It's probably unreasonable to say, I want to take this from a four to an eight. That's, that's unreasonable to do that because you're looking at, at small incremental changes. You could do that over a longer period of time. But if you want to move from four to eight and you're, you're here, it's probably not going to work out for you. So what incremental changes could you make that would help you to move it at least one or maybe two levels above in the next 30 days? Just think of two behaviors, maybe three, not more than three. So rather than, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to reveal what area, but could you mention just one behavior? So everyone knows they're not alone in this, okay? So what would one behavior, you don't have to tell the area, but it may be obvious by the behavior, but what one behavior would you change out of those that you listed? It would be my first volunteer here. Yeah, Nancy. Uh, open up my walk app and start it. <laughs> mm. Open up her walk app and start it. Does it measure your steps? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to work in a management or retail environment, and I realized that one day I could walk nine miles, wow. and it was a small store. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is amazing. So that, that really helped. By the way, that was during the plummet of the, the weight that I talked about earlier that helped me get to that 190. It's someone else. Thank you, Nancy. Mm -hmm. it's someone else. Think about the same thing. We bought a second one for Christmas, and I used it once. I bought it for my husband to recuperate, and I'm the only person that uses it. <laughs> so, so what would be a, a, a the behavior? Yes, using it. So, what would be a way to define that behavior a little bit more? Probably for me, it would be making the time to do it. I get so distracted by other stuff that keeps pulling me away from where I need to focus. Mm -hmm. So getting on it for five minutes. Getting on it for five minutes, yeah. And then and then maybe after a week you could increase it for ten. yeah, may, maybe. Well it's you not know, the maybe time seven to be on it, ten. It's making the time to get down there and do it. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's that 